Hi friends. Now today we are coming live to with to you on this damn silly page on Facebook with our continuing our effort to create integrated medical videos. We call this series Dams Unplugged series. And today I have with me a very famous faculty member, Dr. Tushar. Everybody knows him for his beautiful classes of orthopedics. And we have chosen to present a clinical case to, to you, which is uh, sometimes it is asked as a MCQ in your exams. Sometimes it will come as a patient in your OPD. It's a kind of a slightly rare thing to happen, but it is. It, it, you will see this in your clinical practice. So let us try to, you know, uh, jointly look at a case from a radiologist perspective and an orthopedician's per perspective. I'll hand over to Tushar to present the case. So uh, we are in our OPD and we have a 41-year-old male who is coming to us with pain, swelling, gross limitation of movement which is progressive, insidious and onset for several years, depicting a chronic course of the disease. And most importantly, it's a unilateral problem. So this is what the patient is coming to us with. After looking at all the aspects of the symptoms, we start examining the patient and we look for a significant bulge. That knee is grossly swollen. We check the fluctuation. We see that there is a significant bulge in the medial joint line as we can appreciate by this aroma which is grossly visible if you compare it with the with the opposite knee which is of course the most basic landmark clinical appreciation mechanism in the clinical medicine that you always compare it with the contralateral limb we definitely see some sort of swelling which is extending into the thigh and to the leg even up to the distal part thereby giving us a uh, origin of the swelling to be probably somewhere below the skin and close to the bone involving the fascia and the muscle. Looking at this clinical system and clinical picture living in a country like India, the first thing that strikes our mind is always infection. Infection, tubercular, non-tubercular. We ask the patient about the cardinal symptoms and features of the tuberculosis. Are you experiencing any loss of weight or are you experiencing any loss of appetite? How many chapatis you were having earlier and how many now? So. And apart from that, we always look for uh, ruling out any evening rise of temperature, night sweats, dizziness, fatigue, malaise, so that we rule out that one particular thing, which is the most important infection found in our country. And our country contributes to approximately 33% of the global burden as well, tuberculosis. Certainly, this patient did not give any history related to that. And he was adamant on saying that, doctor, it's a pain and it's a swelling. But certainly we still take tuberculosis as one of the key differential diagnoses clinically. The second thing that strikes my mind is that probably am I dealing with some sort of a rheumatoid arthritis or maybe some arthritis related to rheumatic origin, maybe seropositive or seronegative, but that I cannot rule out on the history. So I start examining on that perspective and I ask my patient about any recent onset of stiffness in small joints of the body as we know that knee is relatively not a very common site for an inflammatory arthropathy like rheumatoid. So he certainly tells me that there is no small joint stiffness, no nodules in fingers or any other part of the phalanges or the metacarpal. So that all comes out to be negative. So with this, I come to a conclusion that the usual things that strikes to me in my OPD like tubercular and non-tubercular arthritis, I've ruled them out. The last thing that strikes my mind is probably am I dealing with some sort of a Synovitis, early onset septic arthritis, maybe, certainly. So I can see pain, I can see swelling, but the cardinal hallmark of septicemia with like fever, chills, rigors, they're not present. And most importantly, what we always miss is that, you know, basic four cardinal signs given by cells as rubor, tumor, dolor, and calor. We have three of them, but we still are missing local rise of temperature in the initial phases. So that strikes my mind and finally I come to a conclusion that I am looking for some sort of a soft tissue condition which I don't know is degenerative or maybe some sort of uh, early onset inflammation or some sort of a God forbid malignancy that I am suspecting. But relatively as of now I am still in a fix and I need to find out my final diagnosis for which I ask for a uh, x-ray. And for that, now, sir will guide you how to proceed ahead. 
So, uh, summarizing what I could understand from you know your discussion, it was, it was actually an excellent discussion that you've done. That we are having a monoarticular disease in a you know middle-aged kind of a person with uh, swelling, effusion on clinical examination, with uh, n inflammation plus minus. This is what we are yes, looking yes, at yes, probably. Yes. Okay. So, on this patient, an X-ray of the knee was advised, which is the more likely uh, to be the next step in any clinical scenario with such a presentation. Yes. We need to look yes. inside and that is where the X-ray would help us. And when we look at the X-ray, this is X-ray AP lateral knee joint. The X-ray findings are like out of proportion to what you saw in the clinical history. You can see large, similar sized ossific areas, calcific bodies in the joint space multiple loose bodies, similar sized calcific loose bodies, what do you think? This is very often asked as a spotter in our radiology exams, very very often asked as a spotter. What is it? This synovial chondromatosis. Earlier we were using the word synovial osteochondromatosis because of the ossification, but now we know it might be just be purely cartilaginous. So now the better term is synovial chondromatosis. So wh why this is? What is this? This is a benign monoarticular disorder. It is also called as Reachel syndrome and what is happening here is there is synovial metaplasia and proliferation which is leading to intra-articular cartilaginous loose body which are relatively of similar size. And key thing I want you to know is not all are ossified. So whatever we are seeing are on our x-ray are the ossified ones but there would be cartilaginous one which we are not able to see on the x-ray. For that which investigation would you do? Which investigation? MRI. That is where the role of MRI comes in to look for cartilaginous loose bodies. So we have a diagnosis here of primary synovial chondromatosis. You could see multiple calcific loose bodies in the joint space and with a clinical history typical of effusion and a progressive kind of a disease. So now I'll you know ask Tushar to you know enlighten us more about the disease and how would he treat such a patient. Basically when we see such kind of a patient and uh, uh, the x-ray of both the knees that comes very obvious to us as we have already seen and discussed by sir that it's a uh, typical of multiple loose bodies inside so this is synovial osteochondromatosis and precisely chondromatosis which is more often seen in a fourth fifth decade of age group and which of course our patient was uh, certainly more common in male as compared to females and the most striking feature that is a kind of a corroborative evidence is that knee is the most common site I mean it contributes to almost 75% uh, of the clinical occurrence of this particular condition followed by hip, elbow and shoulder of course very rarely. And uh, that is probably adding to weight to helping us to diagnose that we saw on the knee joint itself yes, which is the more common. Knee is the most common site for this particular uh, condition. And uh, after this x-ray the next thing that strikes our mind is that we should get an MRI as already discussed by sir. because. Only an MRI is the condition which can help us to plan our treatment. So probably what you can understand is that the final treatment depends upon the MRI because MRI is actually going to give us the three dimensional extent of the lesion. Because any invasive, non-invasive or semi-invasive procedure which has to be planned can be planned only and only if I know the three dimensional extent. Only if I'll be able to understand what is the structure, what is the status of the overlying and adjacent uh, soft tissues because of this particular lesion which is inside. To establish the diagnosis is yet to come but to plan my whatever line of treatment an MRI is compulsory and that is something which is going to guide my treatment. So for all our, all our viewers who are watching us and PG aspirants specifically MRI is not only the, the, the gold standard, uh, not only the investigation of choice but also one of the most important investigation to plan our treatment to, to not only to confirm the diagnosis but in pre-operative planning as well. Now once an MRI is done, I get to know that okay this is my lesion, rather in this case these are my lesions because these are multiple loose bodies. So I get to know that whether they have a fixity to the overlying skin, fascia, tissue, muscle or any kind of a compression over the adjacent ligaments, vital structures like arteries, veins and nerves which of course I could not find on clinical examination but still I need to plan my incision. In order to plan my incision, I need to know that this lesion might have pushed away a lot of soft tissues. So I will not be able to follow the normal routine, routine protocol that I do during surgery. 
So after that complete preoperative planning, the treatment first includes to establish a diagnosis for which initially we plan an arthroscopic biopsy. Of course, there's a minimally invasive technique can be done on an OPD basis, on a, on a daycare basis. We get to have some of the sanable tissue. We get to know that finally, yes, by pathology, that it is a metaplasia, it's a conversion of epithelium, and then we plan the final treatment, and in that final treatment, we perform a complete arthrotomy. That's a wide incision, normally followed by, normally done by midline skin incision and a medial parapetellar approach. Everting the patella, we go inside, we remove all these loose bodies. The most important thing is in toto. They are never removed in piecemeal because this particular loose body, if fragmented, can further dislodge, can lodge itself into the rest of the parts of the joint and can further uh, provocate and propagate the malignancy. Synovium is basically the origin somewhere down the line. So a pan-synovectomy ideally should be performed. But if you have completely removed the loose bodies which are away from synovium, then you can repair it, uh, then you can spare it as well. But one thing is surely kept in mind that recurrence is a very, very common complication if not adequately surgically treated. That's, that's one catch. And uh, as far as all our PJ aspirant viewers, this is one gross specimen of that complete mass that you can appreciate, which is having all the bunch of the intraarticular loose bodies. And this is the patella, the undersurface of the patella that you can feel. There's a, some kind of a breach as well, some kind of osseous depression as well, which has been there because of the compression by these loose bodies. So after shaping up the bone, removing the entire synovium, the entire synovectomy, uh, there is still uh, a, a role of radiation which is done afterwards because although not very common, but malignant degeneration is reported in the literature. So depending upon the condition of the underlying bone and the breach that has been done to the bone, we can plan radiation as well. One thing I would like to mention for all our PG aspirant viewers, this has been a very famous MCQ, I would like to quote it for you, that whenever you have a loose body in the knee, the first thing that strikes your mind is what age are we talking about? If it's an elderly patient, then overall most common cause is osteoarthritis, the degenerative bone joint disease. If it is a young patient, for a, for a single loose body, there's one more thing that comes to our mind is osteochondritis dissecans. But if you have multiple loose bodies, then the condition that we have discussed just now and we have showed it now, that is the most common cause of multiple loose bodies in a young patient like we have presented to you. Now, thank you, Dr. Tushar, for your detailed discussion. And I'm sure, you know, it was a pleasure to hear from you and I. Same Actually, here, we could, you know, in an integrated fashion, I could learn a lot from you in your, Same from your orthopedics same. point of view. So, what I feel is that this condition, synovial chondromatosis, is a very important question as a visual MCQ as well for you, as well as as a you know disease they can describe. Yeah. So that is why we discuss this in this integrated fashion in through our unplugged series. And we also believe that the way forward for medical education is integration. When we we discuss with multi specialty inputs together, we are able to learn together better. And I also want to you know convey through this media again the point that Tushar actually rightly mentioned was the role of MRI. MRI has gone up like anything for joint evaluation, which is very, very important to remember because sometimes, you know, as a medical student or an undergraduate, you might think that for anything orthopedics, you should do CT. While for such conditions, MRI is beautiful. And you can see cartilaginous loose bodies also on MRI, which you cannot see on an X-ray. That is very, very important to realize. That is where he said that the three-dimensional picture can be better done by MRI rather than X-ray. And I hope you enjoy this episode of Unplugged. We enjoy talking to you. If you enjoy listening to us, do write back to us. Do send us an inbox or a message on Facebook or Twitter to me or Tushar. We will be happy to respond. Thank you very much. Do look out for more such videos on our Facebook page. And please follow us on Damn City channel on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you.